Okay, good morning. So it warns me that I'm recording because somehow I still haven't solved this, which device is controlling this meeting issue, or at least automatically controlling meeting. So welcome to Thursday, December 2nd, class session, multivariable calculus at Delta College. We have reached the place where we get to enjoy in a different way the topics we're talking about. We've come to a very important topic, surface integrals and flux through a surface. And we previewed that a little bit last time. Before I do that, uh, I received a question last night that I thought was worth bringing to the whole group about Mathematica. So let me see if I can share something by going to our website. Okay, I'm gonna share browser with you and point out something about the most recent homework you did. And let's see if we can navigate that. Math 261, we're in week 14. Let's look under assessments. Remember, every time you submit a homework, I post the solutions here under the links to the homework. So I think I'm talking about problem 181, but let's just pull it up and see. This is 261 solution instead of 261 exercise. So I try to remember either that night or the morning after to upload solution to the problem. Yes, this is what I wanted to look at. So I had a very nice question about this problem. Part A and B in this problem are not uh, super challenging. The curl and the divergence were pretty straightforward to calculate. Both the double integral of the curl and double integral of divergence were not hard to calculate. In fact, they were exactly the same integral, just with the letters switched. And the region itself had symmetry with respect to x and y axis. So you could work out both of those integrals, or you could literally say that the second integral was exactly the same as the first with the variable switched by symmetry. Uh, you know, be careful when you make a statement like that. You better have a complete satisfaction of that statement. But in this case, the symmetry is complete in this problem. So both of those double integrals are 54. In fact, the symmetry extended to the three pieces of the line integral. Now, I think it's a little bit interesting to notice this as I parameterize, and there's multiple ways to parameterize. I chose to parameterize with the integral, uh, with the interval, excuse me, always one to four. Sometimes people like to parameterize with the inter interval zero to one. So I could have made that into these parameterizations. I didn't think it was absolutely necessary. I think the interesting thing here to notice is the dr and the dn, which everything is made out of straight lines. So these were easy to assemble, but the idea that you write down the dr and the dn at the same time, if you're going to do both the flow and a flex calculation. So these three integrals for the circulation were not hard to compute. The three, and they match the double integral over the curl of the curl over the area. Same thing for the three flex integrals. And they not only matched, they had the exact same numbers of the flow integrals. If you're curious, you might ask yourself why, but that's not what I'm trying to point out here. So we definitely verified both forms of Green's theorem. Now, the question that was asked was how to illustrate this nicely in Mathematica. So you have... Uh, submitted some very nice drawings, just triangles in the field. I like that. That showed enough for you to see or feel that the flux was this or the flux was that, or on this line, the flow was negative. On this line, the flow was positive. But 
I went one step farther and I want to see if I can make this, this is already readable, but if I make it slightly larger, can I make it slightly more readable? Okay, that might be a little more readable. So let's hop to the picture and then work backwards. So here's a picture of the region. Its boundary is a triangle in the field. The field arrows are colored by intensity. So the darker field arrows are low intensity. The brighter field arrows up here in the upper corner are higher intensity. Uh, that choice of yellow isn't always easy to visualize, but you can see how we drive around here. For example, if we move up from 4-1 to 4-4, definitely the field is flowing with me or flowing at my back. But as I move from 1-4 to 4-1, definitely the majority of the time the field is against me. So I should see that flow integral to be negative, and it was. But interesting is how we could restrict those arrows to that path. Now, I don't think one of these pictures is better than the other, but it is sometimes interesting to concentrate on the arrows on the path. So let's walk backwards and see how we did that. And what we have here is a boundary which is a vector plot. And to draw those arrows, I specified points that I was going to draw the arrows on. So vector plot, you can actually specify points where you want vectors to be drawn and only to be drawn there. Uh, the vector color function, I was just playing with rainbow to see what it would look like. That's what created that nice colors, but the awkward yellow. And everything else here is kind of ordinary. But you see, for vector points, I didn't list the points, but I joined three variables. So let's go back and find out what these three variables were. Everything else on this is ordinary. To draw the path itself, I used the function list line plot. So I said, start at 1, 4, go to 4, 1, go to 4, 4, and then go back to 1, 4. So that'll draw three line segments that start at 1, 4 and come back to 1, 4. For the field, the general field, I just did a vector plot with a rainbow color function. So there's no restrictions of arrows right there. But here are the points that I used in the second drawing. I have to wave my hand so my lights don't turn out. So this idea of table creating a list of points. In a way, I should open this up as a live Mathematica notebook in front of you, but I want to make another point about that in a second. So I made a list of points along each line segment. I comma four, and I let I run from one to four, sampling every quarter unit. So that means from one to four is three units, sampling every quarter unit would give me 12 points. Table, although it's kind of suggestive, says table, table creates a list of these 12 points. Points two creates a list of 12 points along the second line of the path, and points three created a list of points along the third line of the path. And if I do these one at a time, I would get a certain coloring scheme. But the key here in my second picture is the word join. Let me see if I can annotate this a little bit. It's not that important that I annotate this. But when I said join points one, points two, and points three, what I did was created a list that had these three lists in them. So I've said this before in Mathematica and you should pay attention to it. Every programming language has a kind of a base unit or a fundamental structure. And 
in many cases, lists are fundamental structures. Uh, this would be the case in Python and R, other languages, and Mathematic and MATLAB likewise. It is turning out, you know, I'm not a computer programmer, but as languages evolve, lists are a great kind of fundamental object to manipulate. So everything in Mathematica is kind of a list. When I do vector plot, the vector field is a list. The specification of X and Y coordinates are a list. The range is a list of lists. And the first list is the X range. The second list is the Y range. When I plot the table, I want to make a list of points. And the points are controlled by a list of parameters. So we could give you many more examples like that, but having a list as your fundamental object is a good way to organize things. So it would not surprise you then if Mathematica has many, many tools for manipulating lists. And you could look up the join tool. So join just takes lists and puts them together. You gotta be careful when you put lists together in some ways, because if you, create lists of lists, you know, if you embed lists inside lists, then sometimes the information you're trying to control is like embedded in la layers of lists, but Mathematica has ways to manage that. So, uh, and uh, uh, a well-known command in that sense would be flatten. If you have a list of lists and you want to flatten the list, so for example, here in line plot, I have a list of lists. Uh, that maybe that's not a good example because we're treating this as a list of points. But let's say it like this. If you spend some time in the Mathematica documentation looking up lists and looking up things you could do to lists, that would be interesting. And so when I join these three lists of points, I'm going to erase that notation now. Then that created the 36 points that Mathematica drew arrows on. And these 36 points were sampled from the field. They were all drawn at the same time. So Mathematica colored them in comparison to each other, matching the colors that I have on the field above. Your graph did not have to look like this. Uh, I had many good graphs and some had legends on the side and some didn't have legends on the side. This intensity legend here was created with this option, plot legends automatic. Sometimes I'd like to check out vector scale because I'd like sometimes the arrows not to be colored by magnitude, but maybe I'd like arrows to be larger or smaller than other arrows. Some of you submitted images like that, which were useful. Problem with that is sometimes the arrows are so small near the origin, the arrows for this field would be so small as to be almost unobservable. But that's a reflection of what's happening. Okay, so last statement I wanna make about the solution right here. So we have our problem we have our solution written out, that's nice. And then we have the Mathematica, some Mathematica documentation to supplement that. I said this in the last lecture presentation. I've posted in many cases, the Mathematica to draw images or such for solutions to the problems. I could post the notebooks themselves, but this is the place I wanted you to do some typing and experimenting. So you already have notebooks that might look a little bit like this. And some of you are submitting notebooks or copies of notebooks that look a lot like this. So remember cutting and pasting is your friend. You don't have to type any of these commands one step at a time from start to finish, but I could cut and paste points, points two, points three. I want you to experiment a little bit with the entering of these commands when I post them as solutions 
So that's why I don't post ready-made notebooks for you for every solution. But I do have several ready-made notebooks for you to illustrate some solutions. Okay, so that was an interesting question about joining lists. So I thought I'd share that insight. But if you look up the Wolfram documentation about lists in general, you'll learn the many, many things you can do to lists and how powerful lists are in Mathematica. So I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna back out. And let's do some examples of surface integrals and flex through a surface. So we are in, back out of here. Maybe I should share a screen one more time to our weekly page. We're talking about this week, divergence and curl. We spent some reasonable time talking about that last time. And we introduced the concept of surface integrals. So now we're in section 6.6 six, and we're gonna do some examples of surface integrals. And maybe we'll just pick some things out of the book after we set up basic surface integral concept. I want to make sure I got my camera pointed at the right thing. Okay, so the fundamental things we're going to talk about here are area of a surface, contribution of a function to a surface, and then the famous contribution called flux through a surface. Okay. Oh, in case you're interested in this, and I'm kind of using web pages to deliver information to you. Uh, the pop-out boxes here for some of these formulas, let me make sure I don't mess this up. Excuse me. Ah. Pop-out boxes for some of these formulas, and you see some of the formulas get a little bit longer, so I have to scroll through them. And then I run into the two fingers scrolling between pages. This is written with uh, Math ML, and it's not hard to show you where this came from. Possibly, let's look at tools, developer tools. Let's look at view source. So here's the source for this page, and let's pull up the area of a surface. And right here, here's a little bit of code that draws S colon vector R of U and V. So this is written in LaTeX. And LaTeX is a powerful language for word processing and for delivery of documents. And some of it, it's built in automatically to Mathematica too. That's why I kept saying to you, Mathematica is a document delivery system, document creation system. But here is where I wrote some simple LaTeX instructions. LaTeX is a markup language like HTML's markup language. It's just sophisticated for presentation of mathematics. So double integral over SDS. That's what this expression says right here. And when I want to see what that does, between the backslash open parentheses and the backslash close parentheses, what's happening is the HTML is reading that LaTeX and converting it to mathematics markup language, which makes these formulas accessible on the page. And that, I think I can show you how it converts that up here in the header. Uh, Let's see what you have right here. This header contains a re reference to an external script. And this external script is used by mathematics people. It's called MathJax. And it reads that LaTeX and renders it in mathematics markup language, which is a subset of hypertext markup language. So again, just a little behind the scenes to see how things work right here. And it's neither here nor there, 
I do not ask you to submit typeset documents, but as you go along in your adventures in education, you might find yourself typesetting documents more often, and you might be interested to know how people typeset documents in HTML. So I just make that little note. Okay, very good. So let's back out of here and start doing some examples. So my suggestion to you was to look up lists in the Wolfram documentation. And uh, there, if you're if you're a fan of books, as I am, there's also printed Wolfram documentation, and printed books that talk about the Wolfram language. And uh, if you're interested, maybe you could borrow a book, or I could lend you a book. So look up lists in Wolfram documentation, and we did a small demo of. MathJax. You can actually look up MathJax online. The mathematics markup language and the hypertext markup language. How you can typeset mathematical notation. in a web page. Okay, so now let's move on to surface integrals and flex through a surface. So I'm gonna draw our context again, but I'm gonna make a kind of a simplified drawing so that we can add some elements to this drawing standard x, y, and z axes. And then let's put a surface on here. So what color should we make our surface? I don't know what color should we make our surface this morning, but I'm not gonna draw an elaborate surface. I just want to focus mostly on the patch of a surface. So let me just draw a kind of a giant patch of a surface. Good. And this patch casts a shadow on the XY plane. And that may be useful to me. It may not be useful to me. What I'm trying to drive at this morning is the concept of parameterization. So this is a surface or it's a piece of a surface. You can take it as you wish. Let's call this surface. S, capital S for surface. I don't, I think that's a little too generic. Some people have a habit of naming surfaces with capital Greek letters. I don't think that's a bad idea. So some people might name this surface capital sigma. But what we said to you yesterday is we, or Tuesday, we could find the area of the surface. How much fabric is in this parachute? So that would be represented as taking the surface S, chopping it up into little surface pieces, and adding up all the little surface pieces. This would be the surface area. But the next step, and the surface area literally has a function of one in here because I'm not going to do anything to each little passive patch of surface. I'm not gonna magnify or weight the patches of surface in any different fashion. But I could, for each patch of surface, examine the value of a function on that patch. And then I could add up over the surface 
S, the contribution of a function to each small patch of the surface. This is called a surface integral. I'm gonna explain how to fill in each of these. Right now, I'm just showing you notation. And then like we did with curves in space, once I decide that I could weight each pass, each patch, excuse me, of the surface differently and apply the value of function to each patch on the surface, maybe this F represents the density of each patch. And then summing the density times the patch area would represent what? The mass of that little patch. And then adding up all those contributions would represent what? The whole mass of the parachute. It's not hard to believe that different sections of the parachute have different fabric weights, right? Okay, but once I agree that I could sum the contribution of a function to a surface, we did the same thing with line integrals, then I can start to get excited about what functions I will sum the contributions of. And so the most useful one in this case, or a very useful one in this case, is the contribution of a function perpendicular to that surface. And this is called a flux integral. So what I want to do is add some things to my image here so you can look at them. Uh, this notation that we're using is standard notation. It's used by many people, many books. I've already made the comment to you on Tuesday that the things we're talking about are used in such a wide variety of places that people have developed many variations on notation. So you really have to pay attention to what you're reading to make sure you're reading and using the notation properly. You have to understand things from their context. The only thing I'm not crazy about in this notation is that I use a capital S for a surface and I'm using a capital S for the little surface element. And when we talked about curves in space, we used a little s for a little piece of distance. So we use the D little s and a D capital S. That's very logical, but it's sometimes awkward to look at an S and decide whether it's a capital S or a lowercase s. So I'm just warning you, you have to understand these things from the context and here I'm using capital S's. So let's draw a little surface patch right here. I'm gonna draw it in exaggerated size. So when I say you chop a surface up into little surface patches, I wouldn't call this a little surface patch, but I would call it, you know, just a representative surface patch. Okay. And what we're interested in now, let's choose the appropriate color to do it. In this last case is this surface is in the presence of a field, a three-dimensional field. I'm not going to draw a full three-dimensional field, but I could imagine that this surface has a field that may not be perpendicular to the surface, may not be parallel to the surface. It just has a field arrow poking out of the surface. You say, it has many field arrows poking on the surface. I say, remember, I'm using this large patch to represent a tiny, tiny patch. So I could think of this whole surface S as many, many tiny DSs with the field arrows poking out of each surface element. So scale here is something that uh, I'm exaggerating. Now, let me do this. What we could have is the field poking through the surface patch, but notice also the surface patch we approximate. Now we're gonna get into the parameterization part. 
with a partial derivative in one direction and a partial derivative in another direction. In a moment, I'll write down the parameterization I'm choosing to name, but let's call this partial R partial U. Let's call this partial R partial V. And these two vectors, if I can draw this neatly, create what? They create a little parallelogram of area. I would like to draw it nicely so it actually looks like parallelogram. There's so many lines on the paper, that's not easy to do. So what does this parallelogram relate to this DS? Well, if the surface patch is tiny, 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 then you already say this parallelogram that I've drawn has an area that may be approximately equal to this DS. But if the surface patch is smaller and smaller and smaller, this parallelogram is probably a better and better approximation to the area. DS. So I say, well, how do I find the area of this parallelogram? I remember how to find the area of a parallelogram. I cross the two vectors and the magnitude of the normal. Let's pretend this is the normal vector n. The magnitude of the normal is numerically the same as the area of this patch. So I have one element, two elements, three elements in these famous integrals. I need to know the area of the little patch ds. I think I'm going to find that by taking the magnitude of this cross product. I need to know how a function, just a generic function, contributes to the ds. Well, I can take a reading of the function on the little surface patch multiplied by the size of the surface patch. But the ultimate is to measure the field flowing through the surface, sometimes up, sometimes down. What's the net flow? And the net flow will be the summation of the portions of the field that are along the normal. In other words, the part of the field that's perpendicular to the surface. Now I've run out of colors, but I could imagine taking this field arrow and projecting it onto this normal. Because I know the dot product represents projection. And that'll be the portion of this field arrow that's literally perpendicular to the surface. And so when I add this up, this will be the portion of that field that's crossing that surface. And it could be wind, it could be water, it could be electricity, it could be magnetism, it could be gravity. It could be any field that I'd like to quantify. So, <coughs> excuse me, I take some time to write this because I want this picture to be glued into your brain. So now let's formally define our surface. And we mentioned this last time. The surface is going to be a description of the position of every point on that surface. But since the surface is two-dimensional, I'm going to literally need two parameters to describe that surface. And since the positions in three-dimensional space, the positions are literally vectors, then I need to describe this position of any point on the surface as an X position that depends on u and v, a y position that depends on u and v, and a z position that depends on u and v. And this is called a parameterization. of s. So think of the u and v
as a two-dimensional universe somewhere else. Sometimes you can embed the U and V in the X, Y plane, but let's think of the U and V as defining a region. I'm just gonna say generically that I use to morph into this surface. And so now in my planning, I see that I haven't quite allowed myself all the room I want. So I'm going to draw a little region down here in the UV universe. And I don't mean to only draw the first quadrant, but I'm just making a schematic drawing. And then I'm going to take some pool, some region in this UV universe. And I'm going to say, this is the region that gets pounded, bent, rolled, sewn into this parachute. So the region R is the domain of the parameterization, the domain of the surface described in terms of U and V. Okay, so now we got a full schematic drawing of the situation. So when I do my integrating, what you see here is I'm even like thinking about change of coordinates. Now, sometimes, like I said, you could embed this region R in the XY plane. It could be as simple as the projection of the parachute down onto the XY plane. And we may see simple examples of that. But I'm taking this care right now to warn you that these problems will be very straightforward after you produce the parameterization. That the hard work in all these problems is often finding an appropriate or correct parameterization of the surface. So I'll just make this note here. The parameterization of the surface and the associated calculations are the most intense portions of doing one of these problems. Uh, I don't wanna to be too casual, but I could say are often the hardest, whatever that means, the hardest part of these integrals. So let's do an example. And let's number our pages. And let's tear off our pages nicely. And, oh, let's warm up on something that's not too crazy. Let's just do a uh, area of a surface. So, Let's talk about problem 274, just to warm up. I'd like to give you a surface area example, a surface integral example, and a flux integral example. 
and they'll roll nicely into each other. So I'm going to start off with a simple case. This is 6.6, .6, number 274. I'm altering it slightly. I want to find the surface area. of the portion of the elliptic paraboloid z equals x squared plus y squared for z between zero and nine. A relatively easy thing to draw and a relatively visual question, like what's the surface area of this object? So uh, Z between zero and nine means X squared plus Y squared goes between zero and nine, which means I'm talking about circles that go up to a radius three. So I'm gonna draw my bowl right here. And I'm not going to draw this to scale. I'm just going to draw it like casually and reasonably. And hard to draw such a thing perfectly. You want to fudge a drawing, just thicken up the lines, add some shading. Then someone thinks you're an excellent artist. So here's the elliptic paraboloid, and let's give a name to this thing so we can use our notation. Let's call this elliptic paraboloid S. And it goes as high as nine units. And you know that it's a circular cross-section, and then it goes from minus three to plus three on the x-axis, and from minus three to plus three on the y-axis. But I'm not gonna add lots of notes and writing on here so that I don't make this too large. Well, here we need a parameterization of S. We need to describe S so we know what this surface area can be calculated with. And see, I have options. And let's pretend there was a strong light shining above this bowl so that I see the shadow cast by this bowl on the XY plane. And you know that the shadow cast by this bowl on the XY plane would be a solid circular disk of radius three. I could call that my domain. I could pretend that I create this bowl by shipping all these points up to a certain height. So I could parameterize this surface by saying R position depends on X and Y, and the position vector will be X comma Y with a certain height. And what height would that be? X squared plus Y squared. And you say, well, well, that was obvious. I, of course I was gonna do it that way. Who would do it any other way? But the problem with making such a characterization is now I have to describe to you where the X and Y live. And you say, well, it's very easy. X squared plus Y squared is less than or equal to nine. Well, that's easy and true. But now when I have to break it up into the individual X and Ys for integration, you know that I have to set these limits carefully. I could choose to let x go from minus three to three. That could be my outer integral. And then I'd have to let y be what? Nine minus x squared. Nine minus x squared rooted plus or minus. Now, what are the advantages of this parameterization that I wrote down here? Very simple partial derivatives. 
Partial derivative with respect to x, 1, 0, 2x. Partial derivative with respect to y, 0, 1, 2y. Relatively simple cross product. But the magnitude of the cross product is going to involve square roots. And this description of the region eventually involves square roots. Now, you already know how I'm going to get out of this. But I'm just saying that in any surface, there are many parameterizations possible. And you want to pick a simple and effective parameterization. So I think in this case, a simple and effective parameterization would be based on the polar coordinates. Now, let me write this badly, and then I'm going to write it nicely. Because I want to point out to you that all the heavy lifting is done in the parameterization. So you say polar coordinates, polar coordinates. Of course, I knew that was polar coordinates before you started. And you say, yes, R and theta. And the x position is R cosine theta. And the y position is R sine theta. And the beauty of that is x squared plus y squared is R squared. Now, the partial derivatives of r with respect to r and theta are going to be slightly messier, but the introduction of the polar coordinates is going to clearly make my limits easier. So I think I'm willing to try that out. In fact, I think when I do, the magnitude of the cross product of the partials, I think I'm going to get more collapsing here still. But I'm going to do one more modification before we do the calculation. And that is, there's nothing wrong with what I've written in red here. You physically see it in the plane. That's why I say you can often parameterize the surface by its shadow in the plane or its shadow in a plane, depending on how it's oriented. But the thing that I'm a little bit regretting here is the use of R twice. And the commitment to the letters R and theta. So there's no right way to do this, but one professional way to do this is to use generic parameters. And then you're not making a commitment to any one particular variable or space. And you're using variables that don't collide with previous variables. And one more benefit, if you use the same generic parameters in every parameterization you create, although you don't have to, then you kind of have some uniformity in the way you present a problem. So if I say U represents R and V represents theta, then I could parameterize the surface like this. You say you've gained nothing. You've just renamed the letters. But I say there is a small gain here and that I've kind of automated or standardized the parameterization. And it's a little bit easier to track this if I'm divorced from the physical picture. Okay, now we're ready to go. So the little surface area patch will be as we've described it in our master drawing on the first page, partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V. The U, D, V, the A, sorry, magnitude partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V, the A, and here the A is this little area element in the region R described by you and me. And so now I'm ready to add up 
the little patches of surface. I got to calculate my partial R partial U. You could use R sub U if you don't like the flowery partial language. This is cosine V, sine V, 2U, partial R partial V is minus U sine V, U cos V, and zero. And now I'm sensitive to the fact that I was about to take the cross product in this order. So if you like, I can just take these written on top of each other and, and imagine the i, j, k on top of them and execute this cross product right here. Partial r, partial u, cross partial r, partial v. Which is again a vector and it is copy or uh, cover up the i slot two u squared cos v with a negative sign in front. So negative two u squared cos v. Then in the j slot, I have to take the opposite or I can start from here. So however you execute it, it's also minus two u squared sine v. And then lastly, in the k slot, I get the cos squared plus sine squared helping me cos squared plus sine squared when I subtract. So I get u cos squared plus u sine squared, which is just u. Now I wanna point out something to you that we're gonna use in the following problem. And then we're gonna wrap this problem up quickly so we can take a break. Do you know that I've created a vector here, right? And what vector have I created? I've created the normal vector. So we need to know in a way, did I create the normal vector that was poking out of this bowl or poking into this bowl? Because I could have two orientations, right? And it's hard to read from this description, except look at the Z slot. Look at the third slot, which is U. And U is characterized by being a number between zero and three. So what I've done with my cross product is created a normal where the third slot is always positive. So this normal that I've created here is literally poking into the bowl. So poking up. So that's the direction or the orientation that I would manage my flow from. But right now I'm just doing surface area. So I won't worry about orientation yet. I'll do that on the next problem or the problem after that. Let's just do the magnitude, <coughs> excuse me. And the magnitude here is 4u fourth cos squared plus 4u fourth sine squared plus u squared square rooted. And of course I get the cos squared plus sine squared helping me out. So in the end, I can factor out a u squared Uh, make sure I do this correctly. And then I'd have a four U fourth plus U squared inside. So when I take this out, I get four U squared plus one. Let's make sure we're reading this correctly. If I ship the U back in, I'd turn into a U squared four U fourth plus U squared. And that's equal to this. Okay, excellent. So here comes my integral. I'm gonna integrate over the region R. I'm gonna integrate the magnitude, partial R, partial U, cross partial R, partial V. With respect to the area of R, which is described in terms of U and V. And that is the magnitude U, times four squared plus one, one half power. I'm looking ahead towards a substitution. Uh, whether I say du dv or dv du here, really it's not gonna affect my integration. I'll write du dv. Then I execute the v from zero to two pi. And I execute the u from 
zero to three. And I think I have just enough room to do this because this is not a terrible integral. This is all prepped for U substitution. In fact, the U comes from doing the derivative of the inside. So if someone asked me where this came from with respect to U, I would begin by saying it comes from U square, uh, four U squared plus one to the three halves power. But now I got to do some compensations because when I differentiate this, a three half come down, I want to kill that three halves. And then when I differentiate the inside, an eight U come out and I want to kill that eight. And then you see that this is just exactly what I need to do this integral. If I differentiate this, I do get this. In a way that's doing U substitution in your head, but as long as you check that the derivative is correct, there's no problem with that. Now let's run this from U equals zero to U equals three. And then let's evaluate this with respect to V, which is gonna be a generous gift. Okay, so what do I got here? I got one over 12. That's this expression right here. And then I plug in the three and I get nine, 36, 37, 37 to the three halves. And then I plug in the zero and I get zero, zero, one to the three halves. One to the three halves is one. I'll just write a one. I subtract them, fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is the inside integral value right here. Now, I'm not gonna write down the second integral because I'm integrating a constant with respect to V. So all that happens right there is I multiply by the length of that interval, two pi. And now I have two into 12, pi over six times 37 to the three halves minus one. Now you could go and uh, estimate this with a calculator or whatnot, but remember 36 to the three halves would be six cubed, 216. Subtract one, 215. Pi over six is one half. Uh, don't let, don't repeat that I said that. Maybe I'll strike it from the recording. Pi over six is not one half, but it's on the order of very roughly. So I'm talking about 215 times one half, a little bit more than one half. So half of this is 115. So I would say, just spitballing it, this is about 120 units. I think I've taken away from your break. So I apologize. But why don't we do this? Let's break. While we're breaking, you either calculate this or pop it into Mathematica, whatever you prefer. And then let's see what the true square footage or square unit area of this bowl is. So I don't have any room to write this anywhere. But let's say back at, got a 901 right here. So let's call it 908. To be generous, we're coming up on 902. So why don't you take a break, stretch your legs. I'm gonna do the same, but uh, just spitballing it. I think I need enough paint to cover 120 square feet to paint this bowl. Okay. We'll be back in a couple of minutes.
Okay, and we're back. And so let's pop over to Mathematica. Let's not only execute this, but let me show you the value of a good parameterization. So over here in green, I've got, you know, all three of these parameterizations are valid. The blue, the red, and the green. In fact, you could execute all of them in Mathematica and you know that the difference between the red and the green is not even worth mentioning. It's just names of letters. But let me show you the value of a good parameterization. So let's execute this green parameterization in Mathematica. Let's check our calculations and check our visualization. So I've already opened up a Mathematica notebook. I'm gonna share it with you. I am sharing it with you. And do you say I type in this function, R of U and V, U cosine V, U sine V, and U. Now remember, if you simply type, be careful, U cosine V. Mathematica thinks you're referring to a function called U cos. So you have to imply the multiplication by saying U cosine V. Good. Okay, so now we got our action together. Now we're ready to do a parametric plot. 3D parametric plot, brackets. And all we got to do is say R of U and V. And we got to run our U's and V's, but we already know where we're going to run a U's and V's. U will go from zero to three. And V will go from zero to two pi. Capital P-I is how you say pi in Mathematica. And I need an extra comma in here. There we go. So do you see, I emphasize, that a vector is defined as a list. And here, my parameters, U and V, are described, the limits as lists. So remember, list is a fundamental object in Mathematica. So here's my parameterization. Well, that stinks. Well, because that's not a bowl. Uh, what did I do wrong in my parameterization? I read back to my paper. It wasn't U cos V, U sine V, U. is U cos V, U sine V, U squared. So there's always room to check your work. And now when I do that and then re-execute, now I got my bowl. I have a little size control problems with my bowl here. Uh, let me make this window larger, which paradoxically makes things smaller for you. But this is a reasonable parameterization of the bowl. And I could decorate it with transparency or color or anything like that, but I'm not interested in doing that right now. I'll let you do that if you want to. I want to check out my integral. So integrate, integrate. I pointed out to you that mathematics, Mathematica can do multiple integrals with one integrate command, but then you got to be careful about how you list your parameters U and V. I still tend to prefer to do it the old way. because then I know exactly which parameter is being evaluated first, but that's just a matter of taste. Raise it to the power one half. I could use a square root notation too. And then let's integrate this u from zero to three and v from zero to two pi. The same parameters here, so I'll just cut and paste in the right bracket order, of course. Let me add some carriage returns to make this more readable. Uh, maybe that's too many carriage returns, but you see the outer integrate, the inner integrate, the limits go. I think I could do with one less carriage return. Result is 37 root 37. That's 37, three has minus one times one sixth, where is my pi? Oh, there's my pi. Remember, Mathematica doesn't write things in the order you and I write things sometimes. Uh, now remember, there's multiple ways I can get a numerical answer out of here. Sometimes the easiest way to get a numerical answer is to tell Mathematica you're using numerical approximations of numbers. And you could do that simply with a decimal place, any point here. Then Mathematica defaults to numerical interpretation which is 117 or 120 wasn't too bad, was it? 
I could also numerically integrate either one of these. And Mathematica would default to a numerical integral. Or I could numerically integrate both of them. Uh, sometimes I prefer to do the exact value and then to follow up with a number approximation of the last element. Remember, percentage sign means the last output. And there's the exact value and the numerical value side by side. Okay, so we've beat this poor paraboloid to death, but we did illustrate how it's really important. It really speeds and simplifies your work to have a nice parameterization. Okay, so let's move on. Maybe I'll come back to a Mathematica notebook later, but <coughs> let's go back to our paper. Three of, so we've done uh, surface area. And so we'd like to illustrate also a surface integral and then a flux integral. We'd like to be respectful of our time. So I'm not sure we're gonna chop both of those into there unless they move very fast. Maybe I should just pick out a nice surface integral. Uh, I'm looking at 292, I'm looking at 293. Yeah, let's look at 293 in the book because I want to point out some bad notation in the book. And I'm not sure if I've said this elsewhere. So I'm going to pull up a copy of this problem in the book and show it to you and show you where I think he uses an unfortunate error in his notation. So I'm looking at problem 293 in section 6.6. 6. So that means I got to find it. I could go to the web version. I don't want to go to the web version right now over text the browsers so i'm just going to find chapter six i'm going to have to go far to find chapter six and then i'll share it with you where am i i'm in chapter five now I'm making progress And six six surface integrals. Here comes the exercises two nine three. And this is just carelessness, not carelessness on the author's part. It's rather carelessness on the typesetter's part. Carelessness in the preparation of the book. Uh, so let me share a screen with you. And this is an issue with some OpenStax books. I think OpenStax is a really remarkable and wonderful project, but I think they ought to have checked some of their books much, much more carefully. The authors of this book, I have a tremendous respect for. They essentially edited and brought in very many useful things. I like that. I think people could have done a better job in the exercise preparation. So here, let's look at exercise 293. I'll write this on my paper. I'll copy it and then we'll go back to the paper. But I want you to see the awkwardness of his statement. So I'm going to say 293. And it was to evaluate the surface integral x minus y plus z, so y squared respect to surface area, where S is defined to be R of U and V equals U squared V U. 
And I'm going to run my use from zero to one. And I'm going to run my V's from zero to one. Okay, so that's a nice little patch right there. Let's take a look at this. He presents us with this picture here, but I think I'm also going to draw this picture on my paper when we transfer to the paper. So what we have right here is a relationship between the three slots. Now, U and V are simply a square drawn in the Y and Z plane. So I could draw this square in the Y and Z plane. And this is what I mean by embedding the region of parameterization inside the space, X, Y, and Z. But the relationship here is that what? X equals Z squared. Now that's a parabola, but it's a parabola. X is the square of Z. So it's coming out like this. Like that. This is meant to be a sideways parabola in perspective. And then likewise, like that. So this is a parabolic cylinder opening in the X direction. And I think my drawing is not as good as the drawing on the paper, but I just want a drawing to refer to. Now, here's what I do not like about this. In his book, he boldfaces the capital S. Well, the person typesetting boldface the capital S, and that is not appropriate. That is a D vector S. And we may use the notation D vector S in a second when we talk about this flux integral. Another way to present the flux integral is f dot d vector s. But there's a difference between d vector s and ds. And this is clearly a surface integral. It is not yet presented as a flux integral. So it's awkward for someone to mix these notations. So I'm still looking at the book with you. I'm about to transfer it to the paper. But what I'm saying, I'm objecting to, is this reference to the DS right here. That should not be boldface. It should not be an implied vector. That's a kind of a casual shorthand that people can use, but it's not being used correctly in this problem. I observe the capital R for the parameterization. I don't really mind that. Lowercase r, capital R, I like to reserve capital R for the region of U and V. Notice he vectorizes the capital R here. That is appropriate because his description, his parameterization is a vector description. But really this S right here in the integral should be a unbolded S. So I'm gonna back out of that. And I'm gonna back out of this and head to the paper. Uh, one more thing, notice he says, uh, you're going to do this with technology. So maybe this integral is not going to come out to be so sweet. And maybe we do have to pull out the big guns to do this integral. But we'll see that as we go along. So back to our paper. Here we go. Let's slam forward. The DS is partial R, partial U cross partial R, partial V, magnitude. Now the DS vector will be partial R, partial U, partial R, partial V in a second. But since I'm only doing the scalar, this is magnitude. I'm talking about a surface integral times the area element in U and V. Okay, go. So now this is nice easy partials, partial R partial U is two U zero one, partial R partial V. This is all the work here. 
So all the work is in the setup, zero, one, zero. And so the cross product of these two, if you visualize your i, j, and k, you can visualize them. You don't always have to write them, but the cross product is negative one cover up the j, give me a zero, opposite of zero is zero, and cover up the k, give me a two u. I'll make this note again for the next problem. Do you know that u is a positive number and the z slot is two u? So the normal vector I've created right here, this is a normal vector. It's a vector right now, it's the normal vector. It would be the vector that's coming up out of that plane or going backwards along the x-axis. But I'm not interested in considering that normal vector in this example still. So I'll just do this magnitude bars. And that comes out to be, of course, four u squared plus one. Well, similar to the last one, but we're not going to get the same situation as the last one. Now we have to evaluate this surface integral. And again, that literally means inserting the parameterization into these variables x, y, and z. So when you do this FDS, integral rest, remember F is a function of x, y, and z perhaps, but x, y, and z are described here in the parameterization. So what you literally do is insert the parameterization into your F. So I put in x is u squared, y minus y squared is minus v squared, and z is u. And now I multiply that by ds. Where's my ds? Mag cross product da. So mag cross product da respect to u and v. And now be careful. I've moved into my parameterization world. So now I am integrating over the region R. This integrating over the surface S is a notational statement. Now I'm actually gonna integrate over the region R described by these two inequalities. So written out in full glory, I will integrate from zero to one, zero to one. I, I'm not sure if it makes any difference what order I do the integral in. But I'll do u squared minus v squared plus u times 4u squared plus 1. And du dv is sufficient. Now, here's where I will, in the interest of time, break off and use some technology. Because you can see that part of this I could do just as I did before. I can have a u times the square root, that would be set up greatly for u substitution straight ahead. But I'm going to also have this square root of 4u squared plus 1, the square root of a sum of two squares multiplied by the minus v squared. So that's not going to aid me in a simple u substitution. And then I have a u squared times here, which is also not going to aid me. So if I wanted to integrate this by hand, I'd use a u substitution and one part, or I should call it a substitution since I'm already using the letter U. I'll use a substitution on one part, but I'll have to use trig substitutions to handle these two pieces. And that would be a lot of fun, but I don't wanna execute that right now. So I think this is what he meant by technology. Technology is gonna aid us. Technology is not absolutely necessary in this problem, but I think I'm just gonna execute it with technology anyway. So let's take this over to Mathematica. I want to get the book out of my way. So I'm going to throw the book onto another desktop. And I'm going to share the same Mathematica worksheet with you. I'm not going to open up another Mathematica worksheet. Uh, Mathematica worksheet. Let's just do this integral. 
that I constructed. And being a naturally lazy person, I will cut and paste. And my integral is similar to this, except this was u squared minus b squared plus u. Got it? My u limits are 0 to 1. My v limits are 0 to 1. So that's different. I was not imitating polar coordinates in this problem. Maybe I could go to polar coordinates in this problem and simplify the presentation of this but I don't want to think about that right now. Do I have my integral presented nicely? Integrate, integrate, correct, integrand. Yes, correct limits, yes. So I feel good about this, let's execute it. And uh, it does involve some awkwardness, uh, hi hyperbolic sine inverse but I could still execute this to an ordinary number, but just as a uh, approximation, the surface integral is 0.9617. Now that is not the area of this surface that we drew. It is the contribution of a function to the area. And this function might represent mass. It might represent density, mass per unit area. It might represent temperature on that surface. It might represent charge on that metal surface. <coughs> so I haven't given any interpretation of this. I've just executed a surface integral. But this is the result of executing that surface integral. And this is the approximate value. OK, so. I think, again, the, the major part of this is the illustration of how to set up, I'm gonna go back to my paper now, how to set up the parameters, whoa, sorry. Just kind of slapped you upside the head there. I apologize. I struck my camera set up. Okay, sorry, the situation here is, we were setting up a parameterization. We were actually given this parameterization, but we had to execute the cross product, the magnitude. We had to insert, that was what we were practicing, inserting the parameterization into the function. And then we get this result, approximately 9617. Okay. So let's do one more. I think we're managing our time reasonably. Let us sit on our paper or sitting on our paper. Let's go to the next sheet. And where are we going? I'm going to kind of like stabilize or reset my camera so it's not looking at the paper oddly okay that's good enough right now so now we have one more example we'd like to present can we actually calculate the flux of a field through a surface and there's nothing wrong with this notation remember in line integrals TDS, we represented with a vector dr. NDS, I'm talking about a two dimensional case now, we could represent with a vector dn arrow, infinitesimal vector. You can think of the NDS right here as a vectorized surface patch and you could call this literally f dot ds i think this is a little too concealing it's a little too slick for our purposes so first let's explain this notation i'm going to go back to my original drawing where i actually had this n here and I actually said to you that the N was 
partial derivative of r with respect to u cross the partial derivative of r with respect to v. But the problem is that's not a unit vector naturally. Maybe I don't want it to naturally be a unit vector. But if I want to unmagnify the value of this force, remember if I let this be different, when I do f dot dn, that actually depends on the length of n. So I don't want a magnified version of this force. I want the true projection onto that. I want the length of the projection onto that, which means I want to use a unit vector here. The unit vector then says I have to take this cross product and divide by the magnitude. Now, so you're a little bit upset right now because like, wow, this N is like a monster to construct. But no, look at the beautiful collapsing you get in the surface integral now. Let's come back to our surface integral and let's rewrite this as F on our parameterization of U and V. Remember, you gotta, you gotta check the field values on the surface. The surface is parameterized by R of U and V. But when you dot by the unit vector, and the unit vector requires me to mag out partial R, partial U cross partial R, partial V. And then the DS, remember, was mag partial R, partial U cross partial R, partial V. You get this very convenient and beautiful collapsing. So to evaluate this means I integrate over R because U and V refer to R and I get to cross out this cross product. In much the same way, you got to cross out the mag V when you did TDS. Remember T was V over mag V. Sorry, I wrote that too close to the top of my paper. And the DS was mag V DT. And you got to cancel out the mag V's like that. And you called V DT DR, because that's what it was. V was DR DT times DT is DR the vectorized infinitesimal element. Well, now I get to say the same thing here so that this surface integral is actually a little bit easier in the sense that I don't have to execute magnitudes, not necessarily gonna be staring at some goofy square root. So I'm just gonna do partial R, partial U, cross partial R partial V times D area element with respect to U and V, you know, DU, DV probably in this case. Okay, we're going along, we're going along. I wanna make sure my previous reference was okay. Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure I'm saying things consistently. So this is a surface flux integral. This integral measures the flux of the field through the surface S, perpendicular to the surface. What part of the field contributes perpendicularly to that surface? And this element right here, is what people refer to as the vectorized ds. Sorry, this pen has run out of ink now. But I don't think you gain anything by referring to the vectorized ds. If you think it's cool and you want to write like that, you go ahead, but just say f dot n ds is just as good. So this is the proper use of the vectorized ds as opposed to the previous problem. So now let's Jump into an example. 
And this is actually easier to calculate because in many cases, easier to calculate because I'm not magging out this cross product. So you have problems you're going to do in there. You know, in a sense, what I'm doing right now, evaluate, evaluate, hemisphere, sphere, part of the plane. I'm trying to pick a good problem we can do quickly, but not too easy of a problem. Now let's look at 286. And I'm just going to write it down. Uh, and I guess I could show you the picture from this. I'll show you the picture, but I'm not going to try to redraw this because uh, I don't think that's a good use of time. Let's do this problem right here. I want to calculate the flux of the field through the surface S. And the surface S is the portion of this plane that lies inside the cylinder. So what I got is a little elliptical disc. If I cut that cylinder, it's a right circular cylinder, but if I cut it at an angle, what I'm preparing is a cross section, which is an ellipse. So I want to calculate the field that is flooding through that ellipse. What's the net calculation? So this will be a good problem because it also make us discuss orientation. He presents picture of surface for you and picture of vector field, but he gives you the three-dimensional vector field, which is a little confusing to stare at. So I'm not going to rely on this picture. Let's just do the calculation. But you can come back and look at this picture if you want and see how you interpret this. Okay, so back to paper, and the field is kind of a nice possibly symmetric field, or you know, some kind of radially outward field. And the S is the portion of the plane. Z equals Y plus one inside this cylinder. And this is gonna be the awkwardness to describe now. Unless I refer to a parameterization. So they want me to calculate the flux of this field through that surface. So I'm going to set my parameterization like this. Generic letters U and V. I'm talking about a circle region. And then I set my Z coordinate to be based on the points in that region. So I think the easiest way to parameterize this is to take advantage of the circles. Let's say u cosine v and u sine v. And as u goes from 0 to 1, and as v goes from 0 to 2 pi, this will fill up this circle, this solid circular disk. But the z slot is going to be the y slot plus 1. So I write u sine v plus 1. That's a little crowded at the edge of the paper, I apologize. Now let's do our cross product calculation. Partial R partial U is cos V, sine V, sine V, partial R partial V is minus U cos V, U sine V, 
sorry, I gotta do this carefully. Minus u sine v, u cosine v, differential respect to v, and here's the u cosine v. And now the cross product, you see what I said at the beginning of our time? The major time investment is the parameterization and the calculations required for the parameterization. That's where you're spending your time. So now let's be careful about this. This is a vector and I will not take its magnitude this time. So I'm just gonna insert this vector right there. So when I cross out the I column, I get U cos V sine V minus U cos V sine V. So in the X let I get nothing. If you think about that plane, you would understand why if you look at what the normal to that plane should be. Here in the Y slot, I get U cos squared plus U sine squared, but I have to take the opposite of that. So it's the opposite of U cos squared plus U sine squared, it's the opposite of U. Using my trig identity. And then in this lap, u cos squared plus u sine squared again. So now the u this time it's positive. Actually, if you think about that plane, and I don't want to draw this right now, but this plane striking this and creating a ellipse, solid ellipse. What is this saying? No X motion, negative Y motion, positive Z motion. So my normal is going that way. You have to learn how to read which direction the normal is going. And now that's important for this calculation. The direction of that normal is important. But the massive break I get is that I don't have to mag this. So now let's take our parameterization, which is right here. Let's insert it into the field. That doesn't look pleasant, but we can manage it. U squared cos squared V. U squared sine squared V. Huh, I'm not gonna enjoy squaring this. So for the moment, I'll put it off. U sine V plus one quantity squared. Let's see if I need to square that. Then I'm gonna dot with zero minus U, U. And I'm gonna evaluate with respect to the area element of U and V. See, I, I was hoping maybe the zero was gonna hit this and I wouldn't have to multiply this out. Well, no such luck. So what happens when I do this dot product is I get, and now let's execute the numbers, zero to two pi, zero to one, that's d u d v order, excuse me. And then I get a minus u cubed sine squared v, and this hits this, and then I get a u, u sine v plus one squared, and this hits this. Of course, the zero hitting this gives me nothing. So this is the integral I have to evaluate right now. Okay, so let's take this to the next page. And again, uh, technologically, there's no barrier to this integral. I could type this in, I could have the answer instantly. I'd like to see if I can just look at it for a second and get me the answer with common sense. Was it Benjamin Franklin said common sense is not common? I forgot, somebody said that. Okay, let's execute this. So I'm gonna write it out. But I'm going to get the reason why I'm willing to do this by hand is I'm going to get severe collapsing of the components here. So this is minus u cubed sine squared v. 
Now I'll multiply this out, which give me a u squared sine squared v, another u on top of that is plus u cubed sine squared v. And then I get a two u sine v times another u. So that's a two u squared sine v. And then after that, I get a one times the u. Now we're gonna have to check this. I think we're gonna have to check this. And I think we reserved ourselves the time to check it, but you see this collapsing right away. That looks like he cooked the problem for me, right? When someone says you cooked a problem, it means that you set that problem up so that it could be evaluated easily. So this part looks like it was severely cooked for us. But also there's a collapsing right here. So first of all, we cross these out, that's zero. And I'll rewrite this as zero to two pi, zero to one, two u squared sine v plus u. But I could do this in either order. Do you understand that? Since these are constant limits, I can switch the order of integration without any serious effort. The so limits are not constant, I have to carefully switch the order. And what's the value of switching the order right here? Some people will just evaluate it without switching the order. Well, I'm evaluating a sine wave over zero to two pi, I'm modified by some number, of course, but evaluate a sine wave over zero to two pi gives me no contribution. So that's gone, that is collapsed. And now I just integrate zero to one, zero to two pi, u dv du. I could re-switch the order. I could just take it as I like. This is a constant times zero to two pi times two pi length. So this is integral zero to one, two pi u du. And you could evaluate this by thinking of it as a triangle, if you like. What the heck, let's go full geometry mode, zero to one, triangle, it's two pi high. What's the area of that triangle? One half base times height. So this is equal to pi. Now it's really not fair for me to just like rip through that integration and not check it. So we're going to go type this in as we wrote it here but I'm hoping this turns into just a pi. At least I'm hoping I've interpreted that way. And you understand that when you do integration, you look for things like this. Integration is not about writing pages of symbols. Integration is about interpreting the meaning of this integral. And you interpret the pieces correctly and you did no integration. You did actually no integration, but area calculation is integration. So let's take this to Mathematica. I'll share a screen with you. And again, let's do our famous copy and paste. This time we're integrating u cubed sine of v squared. I wanna be careful how I present that in Mathematica. This is how you write. You can't write sine squared V directly. And then I wanna add U parentheses squared. And this is gonna be U space sine V, not U sin V, but U space sine V. Without that space, mathematics thinks you're creating a new function called u sin. u sine v squared, but there's a plus one in there. Now let's make sure we got our parentheses in order. It's complaining about my parentheses. This time v goes back to zero to two pi. So let's see, did we type this in as we saw it? There was a minus sign on there. That's where I 
slipped in that silly parentheses. Got it. I think we're presenting this as we intend. And it is pi. Now I'm going to go back to my picture and say, excuse me, get out of here, get out of here. And let's interpret that pi. This is really important. Share screen, back to the picture. Remember how we said that the normal we're using is going upward out of that plane? Now, I calculated my flux to be pi. That's positive pi. So what did I just calculate? I calculated that the field is indeed, the net flow of that field is upward through that elliptical patch. And it's quantified as pi units of field. However, I'm gonna measure units of field. We might talk about that on another day. But do you see when the flux integral came out to be positive number, that meant that I knew which direction the field was flowing net. The field was flowing net with my normal. If I would have come out with minus pi, then I would have said, does my field have negative flux? Well, I have to interpret negative flux. What would negative flux mean? It would mean that the field was blowing through the window the opposite direction of my n. But my n I noted already was upward with respect to this plane. And the flux is positive pi. So I know that the net field flow through this elliptical window, net flow is upward. I don't know if it's coming in or out at some portions. That would be something I could see if I drew a better field picture. That's why his field picture is it's okay, it's not excellent. Okay, what I'm gonna do is stop sharing because I gotta wrap this up. I got to get my... Uh, recording uploaded and I think thankfully I've done all my recording correctly so uh, you can hang out for a second ask a question if you like sorry but I'm going to stop the recording and then I'll wrap this up and I got to go to an office hour